Our original plan was not to introduce him at all because most of us know about, uh, about him and are here to. So most of us do know about him, but uh, Sri Sri uh, Guruji, he's a renowned humanitarian leader, a spiritual teacher, and an ambassador of peace. But perhaps we know one more appropriate than him uh, to come in a conference on peace and on a day of peace with him. So, Guruji, our conference is on peace and it's at three levels. So there is peace within, which we are touching on today. Tomorrow it's peace with others. And day after tomorrow it's peace with the environment. And the day after that is action project. So they'll come to the ashram and to another place and do some shramda, some actual work. And then the discussions of this uh, meeting go on to the UN and to other places. The declaration of essentially what the South Asian youth want uh, in terms of the process ahead. Uh, so that's where it is. Uh, Shri Shri has always uh, been a proponent of stress-free, violence-free society, united millions of people across the world. Very key role in conflict resolution, so he is perceived as a neutral figure who has a peace agenda and that really makes him one of those icons who can really take the cause of peace uh, and take it to all directions, to opposing sides. Uh, he represents hope, he's brought opposing parties to the negotiation table and that's a skin that all of us would love to have. Uh, and across Kashmir, Ivory Coast, Iraq and the broad idea for him is to talk about humanity, talk about peace and that's what he's here for. Uh, on behalf of the participants, Guruji, I'd like to welcome you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Young leaders here, our questions are pretty much around fame versus anonymity, working, uh, managing our egos when we work, scale versus small, anger versus peace and inaction, uh, pretty much dilemmas of us as we lead organizations. So, uh, so here we have Guruji. You forgot to give the flowers to bring it What is very common between peace and conflict? I begin with a question, a challenge for you to answer. What is that something which is common? There is only one thing that is common between peace and conflict. What is that? Emotions. Both are informal. <laughs> peace cannot be formal. Peace is an informal happening. Personal and in informal. Conflict also begins informal. Are you with me? Conflict and peace is informal and personal. You can't have an impersonal conflict or a formal conflict. So, where do we look for resolving it? It has to be resolved in an informal atmosphere. You know? Are you with me now? See, as I'm saying this, your mind has already started thinking. Well, then, yes, no. Well, if you see in the parliament, the parties fight on the surface, but inside they are very happy with each other. You know, they sit and talk to each other, have a cup of tea together, 
But when it comes to the parliament, when it comes on the floor, there is conflict. This is just a formal conflict. I tell you, it is not even genuine conflict. If the conflict is genuine, if it is informal, it can be resolved. But if it, the conflict is just a show, I tell you, there is no way to resolve it. <laughs> you have to live with it. So first of all, let's see the root cause of conflict. Miscommunication or no communication, number one. Set ideas, a narrow ideology, number two. Third, fear of the other. Fourth, one's own stress and tension, which obstructs one's perception and one's expression. And the fifth is circumstantial. So these five aspects of a conflict need to be looked into. Then you will find there is peace. I would go from the last one. First, last but one. That is looking into the stress. If you are stressed, even a compliment that comes to, in your way will appear as, as an insult. Haven't you experienced this? Huh? Suppose a day you are very stressed and you go, someone is uh, giving you a compliment, say, oh, you look very good today, you feel they are mocking you. They are throwing in, hurling an insult at you. So, the context of today's talk, peace within, comes right here. You know, the stress and tension inside you, insecurity and fear inside you, and the guilt and fear within you can cause such a cloud from within you that would obstruct your perception of reality. Are you with me? So you need to set right this now. Become peaceful. How do you do that? Just as we were coming, our dean was asking this question uh, that, you know, today you don't know how to forgive oneself and forgive others. See, in interaction, you always come across conflict. That too, they are intelligent people. All sheep will go in one line. There are no conflicts. But intelligent people get into interaction, each one come up with a better idea than the other, then conflict is uh, quite normal and I feel it's healthy. There is an old proverb in India that says, uh, fear among the snakes, laziness among the lions, and difference among differences among the intellectuals make the society and the world healthy. The world is a good, better place because few snakes are so scared. You know, they run away. You are scared of snakes, but they are more scared of you. Lions are so lazy; they they go for one prey and then they sleep for <laughs> for the whole month. So, if lion becomes very active and dynamic. It will finish the whole forest. <laughs> Similarly, the intellectuals, if they are not in conflict with each other, if they don't argue, something good will not happen in society. So you see that positive aspect of conflict is something good is going to come out of the conflict, number one. Second, few moments of introspection, inner reflection, relaxing, letting the stress go, Seeing life from a broader perspective. A perspective. Yeah. That can reduce the stress. Now, reflect what, what the events of, this, of your own life in the past you have had been 
You have gone through such very stressful moments, haven't you? You know? And you have come out of it. Every time there is an examination or you have to go for an interview and it, it has created some anxiety, yes? Yes. Yes. yes? yes. So, but you have overcome them all. So, reflecting on the past incidences in your own life or learning from others' experience, we can overcome the tension. And breathing exercise, pranayama meditation is an excellent remedy for this. Whenever you are upset, or you are anxiety, you are suffered from any sort of tension, do some ujjayi some breathing exercises, some meditation, it will put you back on track. So when you are calm, when your inner, uh, sta inner stability is achieved, you feel normal, then your perception improves, your observation improves, your expression improves, your communication improves, everything turns around, you know. And then, so perception, one way to uh, get out of inner tension, inner contact. The second is humor. If you have a pinch of humor in you, it will grease all friction. You know, that's, that's important. That's one thing that's very important. If we have compassion, an unknown strength just develops within you. And you will feel that no party can shake you because you have the power of compassion from within you. So you know what's happening? As I'm speaking, few minutes later the mind drifts away. Right? Isn't it happening? Yes? Take a break. Whenever there is conflict, you take a little break from that. Sit back, relax. Shall we do a short meditation? In a peace? We'll do that now. Meditation is simply relaxation. Are you ready, everyone? Everyone here? Huh? So you can't get up in the middle of the meditation, you will disturb everyone else. So we'll do maybe five or six minutes short meditation, maybe five, ten minutes meditation, okay? Let's sit comfortably and easily. Was it good? How many of you enjoy? Be informal and utilize your hand. <laughs> Did you know you meditated for about uh, 16 minutes? <laughs> Didn't feel the time? It looked, looked like 5 minutes, right? That is inner peace. So, every day a few minutes if we sit and relax, Consciously. You know, when you are tired, you just knock the pillow and then that's it. You, you don't know what's happening next six to eight hours, right? You fall asleep. Sleep gives you a type of rest. But meditation gives you a different type of rest in which you are conscious and yet you are relaxed. This is really this, the, the crux of inner peace, right? Conscious relaxation is essential. Hmm? 
So from inner peace, you can create an atmosphere around you which is more peaceful. See, hunger, the hunger in the world cannot be removed by feeding the mass because there is nothing like mass hunger. It's individual hunger. If you take care of individuals, and then hunger can be eliminated, right? So a particular disease, when it has to be eliminated from the world, what do you do? Smallpox, you treat each and every individual. Then you claim smallpox is eradicated. In the same way, if conflict has to be eradicated from the world, we have to educate and treat the individuals. Are you with me? Do you agree? Huh? So, an individual comes up with an idea for conflict. Similarly, individual can bring up the concept of peace as well. Hmm? Now, if you have some questions, I'll take them. Yeah, I know how your mind works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mind works. Well. You skillfully make the mind quiet, right? Fighting is not the way for mind to become peaceful. That's the problem. Many people think. Meditation is concentration, chase the thoughts away, try to make it blank. The more you try, harder you try, lesser you succeed. Right? So, the little skill, if you accept all the thoughts and allow the things to happen, the mind settles down. Right? Uh, when you spoke about this one's in the mind. Spoke about conflict and peace, uh, and also your inner peace. Uh, but what if the person uh, in front of you thinks your being silent is your weakness? Your being silent, or uh, you know, getting back one step is your weakness. No, see, I am not telling you should be silent when you have to speak. You have to be silent. And at the same time, you have to be dynamic, you have to be vociferous as well. You have to be active as well. It's not a passive silence, what I'm talking about. Reduce the temperature a little bit. <laughs> you see, when it's little, when it's too hot, what do you do? Reduce the temperature. When it's too cold, what do you do? So, if in your experience you have found that you have been overconfident over and over again and again, then next time be a little more cautious. It will happen automatically. You know, learning is automatic process. Our system is made such, our brain immediately tunes into that. Now, there is all probabilities you will lose confidence because you are overconfident. And that you need to balance. Then I say, no. Yeah? That middle path. That's where intuition will help you. If you do a little bit of meditation every day, your intuitive ability will develop then you get the right amount of confidence that you need. <laughs> yeah? Uh, is, there, is there something called right time, good time and bad time? Uh, 
uh, good time as in you know when everything works your way bad time is you know despite trying all that you can nothing works and how do you deal with uh, you know so called bad times hmm. in bad times you must remember this will pass this time will pass and bright time is going to come by only just that one thing this will pass will pull you through it Yeah. Yes, yeah, speak. I think we can hear. Guruji, actually, I am in this stress for past few years, thinking uh, of a teacher. I always think uh, of after going up twenty years, after ten years, what would I do if if I did, uh, if I couldn't uh, achieve my goal, and what would I? I can concentrate on what what I am doing now. I am always bother of my teacher, and uh, that making me stress. I tell you, it's very good. Don't worry. <laughs> Take it from me. You have a bright future. My question is especially in India, where we have so many religions and social beliefs. Why is it so difficult for us to live in harmony with them? Because we are all so different. You know, if you go all around the world, you will find India is the most easy when we accept everybody's yes. belief system. We let everyone do what they want to do. If you go to villages, that is not the case. People live in such harmony. I have seen in in India, you know, Hindus and Muslims live side by side. Even here in the villages, in rural areas, all over, there is a Ganesh Utsav, and you know, there is a Muslim who is part of that committee. He is organizing my, and then there is some Islamic function, and Hindus are all there supporting them to do the work. If you have been around the world, you will see in India there is real there is real example of communal harmony. There are some sporadic incidences here and there and there and there, but it is insignificantly small when compared to what you see in the whole world. Yeah, it's lack of education. See, we identify ourselves as. Something, somebody. We have to see it. Our first and foremost identity must be: we are part of one light. Second, we are human beings. Third, we are male or female. Fourth, we belong to this religion or that religion. Fifth, we belong to this country or that country. Right? Instead of that, if our priority is, oh, this is my religion, those who do not belong to this religion. Are no longer belongs to me. We don't have sense of belongingness with them, right? This type of non-belongingness should be done away with. That is what is spiritual education. Yeah, when you feel a sense of connection, belongingness to everyone, irrespective of what faith, what religion, or what nationality they are, you know. The ancient concept in India was Vasudhai Vakutumbakam. The whole world is one family, right? That's why so many schools of thought in India. See, there's not one. There is, there is Vaishnava, there is Shaiva, there is this and there is that. So many different religion within religions, but yet. Uh, there is certain harmony. It's because of the spiritual energy. Yeah. I even wrote this question when you were in Nepal. I'm Sona Bhatta from Nepal, and my question is: Is it true that our lines of our hand determine our life, or is it our life that determines the lines of our hand? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about the lines. You want to change, then you can do that. <laughs> Some lines keep growing; they keep changing. Um, there is some truth to some road map is there. People say, but it is not hundred percent. Uh, you know, non-flexible. It is flexible. Hmm.
I make many lines. <laughs> Spirituality is the essence of all religion. While religion divides you, spirituality unites you. Spirituality is the experience. Spirituality is compassion. Spirituality is your interaction with everybody, your ability to embrace everyone, your ability to connect with the cosmos, the infinity. That is spirituality. And today's, you know, fast world, we need everything fast. No doubt we need to See, we did a short meditation. If you tell someone, oh, we did 15 minutes meditation, mind was so quiet, people will say, no, I can't believe you. Because to do that meditation, maybe you have to spend maybe hours and hours to make mind quiet, right? So not necessary that way. So every age and every time has its own tailor-made uh, techniques, knowledge, which would help human evolution. God. First you tell me what is God, then I will say whether I believe it's God. I fail to understand. So you are asking about some concept of God. If God is love, yes. God is energy, yes. God is the substratum of the whole creation. It's a d different thing, you know. So believing is something, but just knowing is something else. Yeah? So there is a power by which everything runs in the universe, right? Yeah? Some unknown power, right? Uh, Nasir, uh, since we are talking about uh, each belief, uh, we it's all about inner satisfaction. And based on this thought, I take some decision. But uh, simultaneously, I find that uh, because of this, some other people who are not peaceful. So, and it disturbs me a lot. You know, if you take a decision for peace, nobody will be disturbed by that decision. But if you are taking a decision for your pleasure, others definitely would get disturbed by that. So there's a distinction between peace and pleasure. You got it? I uh, request you to use the mic because this is getting webcast. And people who are watching it live cannot hear. <coughs> To our guru, we expect, we the youth of India expect a lot of <coughs> like some good sense. So, what in return do you expect from the youth of India? Not only India, from youth around the world. I want the youth around the world to own the world right away and not allow the world to be distorted, environmentally polluted uh, and destroyed in more than one way by the greedy people. I want the youth to take charge of the world and its politics, cleanse the politics, you know, spiritualize the politics, socialize the business and secularize the religions. Then the world will be a better place to live. So, following on what you just said now, uh, the Western civilization has uh, more and more taken the equation of God out of the public place and more and more India is also going towards that, that when we mention the word God we should say it in harsh tones and the scientific community will say this and that. Is peace possible without God? Yeah, peace, uh, I mean, without any belief system, peace is still possible. You know, that's what Lord Buddha did. Buddha said, he's not going to talk about God. He said, I'm not going to talk about God. Not that he didn't believe in God. He simply said, I will not talk about God. Because this country people had so many ideas about God even before that. So it will be simply a theological struggle. But he said, one thing I want to tell you, we can be free from misery. We can be quiet in our inner self. Right? 
So meditation and non-denominational, non-denominational meditation can all help in uh, bringing peace in the world. And accepting others' point of view. See, there was only one Jesus. And today there are 70 schools of Christianity, 70 different sects. There was only one prophet Muhammad. You have Shia, you have Sunni, you have Ahmadiyya, you have many different Wahhabis, Islam. There's only one Buddha. Today there are 32 sects of Buddhism. And Hinduism, you can't even count them. There are too many. So many sects are there. So many uh, uh, branches of them. So what I'm saying is, keep aside all that. Take good things from everybody. You know? Being a communist or irreligious didn't work. Forty years, Russia tried, China tried, and it, they couldn't succeed. You know, they demolished the church and built a swimming pool. Today, they demolished the swimming pool and the church has come back again. So, what I'm saying, what we should learn from this is, we should have an open mind. Every child learns a little bit about all the scriptures in the world. They can become a better citizen. Terrorism will be rooted out of this world. Terrorism is because only I know the way of God. I will go to heaven, everybody else is going to hell. So that person really creates hell for everybody else. <laughs> so if every child knows a little bit about Upanishad, the Gita, a little bit about Quran, a little bit about Bible, a little bit about Buddha's teaching and Mahavi's teaching and Guru Nanak Dev's teaching. So you'll be enriched with wisdom. I would say we need to globalize wisdom today. Don't you think so? If we globalize wisdom, there would be terrorism in the world. There would be problem, religious fanaticism in the world. We need to break that. See, we accept food from every part of the world. We accept music from every part of, don't you? You all go eat Chinese food, you eat Bengali rasgulla. A Bengalian will not become a Bengali if he eats rasgulla. Similarly, a Muslim will not lose his religion or her religion if he reads uh, Bible or if he reads Gita. Similarly, Hindu, if he reads Buddhist scriptures or Bible, they won't lose their own faith. You can be strong in their faith, at the same time you can appreciate and acknowledge other faith and make life a bouquet like <laughs> two, two questions are there. Polonianism versus Dionysianism. And I was, can you repeat it? Repeat it. I recently went through the article of Frederick Nietzsche, Apollonianism and Dionysianism. So, in between, I was talking two of the points. What is wheel of Maya and what is tragedy? So, if you could clarify. What is? Wheel of Maya and second one is what is tragedy? You know, the English word Maya, uh, English word measure comes from the Sanskrit word Maya. Maya means to measure. The whole world is Maya, means the whole world can be measured. Right? Everything here, the light can be measured, sound can be measured, touch can be measured, taste can be measured, isn't it? Everything here can be measured. Right? And that which is changing is also called Maya. Everything is changing. Vijay, I want to yeah. ask uh, about the mystic forces. About the mystic forces, right? So I was talking. I was reading about Buddhism, and there is this chant that you, when you recite that chant, you know, you uh, you gain all the mystic forces around it. And there's this book by uh, Rana Bai called The Secret. It's all, it, that also talks about the mystic forces. You know, whatever you are right now, whatever you will become in the future, is because of gathering those mystic forces. But then at the same time, again, you know, uh, in Hinduism, it says that you know. Uh, your, your future is predetermined. So isn't that like contradictory? And I'm still very confused as to, you know, is it the mystic forces? No, or? the mystic forces in Hinduism also there are mantras, they are called mantras. You chant mantra, Om Namah Shivaya, all the negative vibrations will go away, negative influences will go away, Om Namo Narayana, you, you chant, your health becomes strong. This is there, you know, the mantra, there is some 
power to the mantras also, vibrations. That I will take up some other time. It's a very deep subject. Uh, Guruji, I want to know what you mean by the art of living. Not the organization, but as an artist, I'd like to know what you mean by the art of living. You know, we do everything for life, but we know we fail to appreciate life as such, life itself. So art of living for me is appreciation of life. Art simply means appreciation. Isn't it? You you draw some lines and when you start appreciating it becomes art. So if you can appreciate your own life and the gift that is life, I call it art of living. Guruji, I have a question. I always wonder that why there is such a contradiction in South Asia, where uh, basically this is a land which has given um, uh, you know, techniques of meditation, Buddha was here, and, and uh, on the other hand, we, uh, if you look at uh, the situation right now all over the world, uh, this is uh, one of the most uh, disturbed parts uh, of the world. So why is such a contradiction? Yeah, I have the same question. <laughs> you know, South Asia, if everyone get together here, come up with such an understanding, not just play in the hands of politicians and religious fanatics. South Asia's economy can boom. You know? It, a lot can happen in South Asia. You know, the trade, because we have the largest population of young people in South Asia in the world. So if Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Thailand, all these countries, Sri Lanka, they all get together, we can eradicate poverty, we can eradicate conflicts, we can bring peace and prosperity, progress to the entire con uh, continent. So the responsibility lies on our youths now, more and more on our youths. You know, whether it's Nepal or in Sri Lanka, there is a lot our youths can do. Cultural integration, deepen your roots and broaden your vision. You, every, every state, every area has its specific special qualities. You know, we should nurture that. Karnataka has its beauty. Kerala has its own type of food and culture, music, dance. Similarly, Bangladesh, I'm sure every part of Bangladesh has got its own uh, variety of cultures. We need to strengthen these differences, not eradicate the difference. There is a tendency to eradicate difference, all make it one. No. I feel we should nurture the differences and then uh, bring everyone together in a common vision of pro peace and prosperity. Thank you. On behalf of the organizers and I guess uh, the team, one last question. that uh, We are all at a stage where we face a lot of life choices. We have choices to either go into the corporate, make a lot of money, be in the NGO sector, be in politics. What basis do we take a call on this? How do we decide? Listen to your inner calling, you know. Uh, I want youngsters to get into politics, no doubt. At the same time, uh, it's good you should also go into corporate uh, sector, do business. Today, you know, in this world, you, if you see our parliament, there are a number of people who are also businessmen. They are business people and then they enter to politics. Or there are politicians, later on they enter into business. 